I'm Audrey Kovac, and I would like to welcome everyone at the Institute for Cultural Relations Policy's next webinar series. This time, the topic is cultural relations as a tool of diplomacy in international relations. And the goal of these webinars is to discuss both the theory and the practice of this topic. Cultural diplomacy, according to the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, can be described as a course of actions which are based on the exchange of ideas, values, traditions, and other aspects of culture or identity, whether to strengthen relationships, in his socio-cultural cooperation, promote national interest, and beyond. Cultural diplomacy can be practiced by either the public sector, private sector, or civil sector. Our first guest is Iraki Kakabadze, a Georgian writer, performance artist, peace and human rights activist. Kakabadze holds a master's degree in conflict analysis and resolution from George Mason University in Virginia. He worked at the US National Peace Foundation, was the editor-in-chief of Time for Peace magazine, and he is the representative of the US Institute of Public Diplomacy in the South Caucasus since 2004. Since 2006, he has been the chairman of the Equality Institute. He is the author of five books, and he was awarded with several prizes, like the Oxfam Novi Pen Award for Freedom of Expression or the Lillian Hellman Hammond Grant from Human Rights Watch. Welcome here, dear Iraqi. Thank you very much for having me, and I'm very delighted to be at this very distinguished panel. And I think that the issues that you are discussing are very important, and I think that cultural diplomacy and cultural issues need to be at the forefront of our consciousness right now, since we're entering the new era, the new time of post-industrial development around the world that is very, very uh, full with the challenges of uh, overcoming the cultural differences and how to interact. This world is becoming a one uh, village, how to interact in this multi-dimensional, polyphonic, multi voice of the world. Yes, I also think these are really important questions and uh, also the goal of this uh, whole webinar series is to discuss these questions and um, I think we can start. Uh, uh, how would you prefer we should start with uh, the questions or would you like to say some words? I say I, I, I could start with the introduction into what I would like to say since we, Anna and I have discussed this subject a lot and uh, uh, I think it's very important to know there are a number of factors that um, are contributing to the escalation of the situation. Right now in the South Caucasus we have two conflicts that are kind of brewing, one of them between Azerbaijan and Armenia and uh, already there were skirmishes about a month ago and Azerbaijani forces attacked Armenia. And uh, of course there was a retaliation after that. And then of course another conflict uh, at, around the David Kareja Lavra, which is between Azerbaijan and Georgia. Um, uh, and uh, the both sides are claiming the possession of the, uh, of the uh, David Kareja monastery complex that includes 16 churches that um, the Georgians see as their possession of the Georgian Christian church. And then uh, Azerbaijanis are insisting that this is uh, their own possession. And now, of course, we have seen the situation with Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, and we are seeing the explosion of the bomb in Lebanon. And we are seeing many multicultural conflicts that need to be solved. There are a number of works on that in the field of conflict analysis and resolution, not to mention Kevin Albrook's and Pete Black's um, a book about the cultural differences. And there are lots of other very important works in the field of conflict transformation and resolution that are dealing with the issue of the conflict transformation. Uh, Johan Galtung has a term of uh, um, cultural violence. And I would say that today in the world we are seeing uh, the example of the cultural violence well, uh, were unfortunately multiple narratives and cultural understandings of the, of the uh, terms of equality and the democracy are not really functioning. Is a single voice um, basically uh, 
policy implemented most of the time through financial pressures and the force. And that was the situation before the pandemics broke out. And after pandemics, of course, we are seeing the change of lots of things. And right now we're gonna see probably the change in this direction as well. And we hope that, that there will be a progress and not just a change that will bring a war or confrontation. And for that, we need to mobilize our forces and remember uh, several very interesting points. Number one is uh, the, the, the presence of the cultural imperialism. Uh, one of the things that fueled the fanaticism and uh, e either it's uh, Islamic fanaticism or Christian or other types of the ethnic and religion fanaticism is that um, a monolithic uh, voice of the um, neoliberal expansion, uh, not through, not just through the economics. I mean, neoliberal expansion takes place in the culture as well. And people are being taught how to behave, how to, uh, how to basically uh, plan their lives, and how to uh, structure their cultures. And in this uh, respect, I would say it's a very valuable, uh, there are lots of very valuable readings on this subject, of course, and uh, uh, we have very pro prolific actors throughout the world. But I would say, I would mention uh, Edward Said's work, of course, Orientalism and Culture and Imperialism. Those two works are very good and they're written in 1970s and 80s, but they are very much corresponding to today's realities. And what the process that has started, and of course, 19th and 20th century were the ideas of enlightenment were brought in as a universalist ideas of uh, helping everyone through the methods of the physiocrats originated in France or uh, Germany or uh, most of all in Great Britain. Um, of course, they helped lots of societies and it brought lots of progress in scientific terms. But at the same time, it proved to be unacceptable to the a big majority of the world's citizens, including uh, Confucians, uh, Buddhists, uh, Hinduists, and most of all of the Muslim communities around the world that are numbering about 2 million people, 2 billion people. And it's a huge number in terms of population. And we have to admit today that those physiocratic approaches of the of the some of the architects of enlightenment uh, were not so effective, and because they proved to be not so effective, we have received a clash and backlash from those cultures, which manifested in the very ugly forms in terms of the terrorism. And we saw two days ago the blast, horrible blast in Lebanon, and uh, God forbid it will, it will repeat. And of course, we have seen 9-11. We have seen blasts in London, in Madrid, in Berlin, in Paris, and other places which were um, horrible realities of 21st century. We are, uh, we are witnessing a cultural war, a big cultural war between uh, the, I would say, I would not call it the Christian Muslim um, confrontation. Of course, it's not. It's not a religious confrontation, but it's a confrontation between physiocratic neoliberal culture and, uh, and, and rules of behavior, and then lots of traditional, different traditional cultures that have their own ways of life that were there throughout thousands of years. And of course, they need to change, and we all need to change every day. Yes, we are very much Bergsonian in that understanding that will tell every human being is changing. And we need to change towards equality in a gender sense. We need to change towards equality in a race gender sense. And we need to change, of course, towards equality in a, a class sense because we have too many people that are left behind and by basically, um, I mean, left billions of people are starving today. And we are seeing even worse situation when the pandemic hit us. Uh, we are seeing lots of inequality, immense amount of inequality in the postmodern world, where we have an amazing technology, and a great technology that is able to achieve wonderful things. We are able to change our gender. We are able to change lots of things. And we are able to treat heart diseases and cardiovascular diseases. All of those things are 
um, amazingly treated by the technology. But the delivery of food is a problem. Almost one billion people are starving, according to UNDP data, and are dying of starvation. Thousands of children every day, about 22, 23,000 children every day die out of starvation when they don't need to die. Yes, about 160,000 people, according to data by UN, which is not very recent, but recently it has not changed. Unfortunately, it has changed probably towards the negative. But 160,000 people are dying out of hunger when they don't need to die. So we do see lots of social injustice, and uh, we do see a really, really a very, very big uh, uh, inequalities around the world. And um, uh, physiocratic approaches, of course, are not working. Um, we need to adapt to the cultural milieus of different uh, civilizations. And I mean, there are lots of talks about this, lots of scientists, social scientists have uh, discussed this. And uh, Edward Said is, of course, one of those main protagonists of this um, a narrative. And uh, we need to listen to those voices and adopt and elicit how we can have more egalitarian approach between cultures and what kind of examples we can bring to stabilize the situation. And we have the cultural conflict here in Georgia and in the South Caucasus, and we have cultural conflicts everywhere. And globally, there is a big sense that more and more people are being mobilized. And in some cases, it, there are lots of conspiracy theories floating around. And you see a uh, huge number of conspiracy theories originated because the physiocratic culture and the culture of neoliberalism is not really giving enough food to feed either physically or spiritually the disenfranchised population of the world. And the world does not necessarily today, seven and a half million billion people live in the world, doesn't necessarily have the democratic structure where one citizen is one voice. The world has not a voting system. There are some system, countries that are more wealthy that have more democratic systems. But then, of course, the poorer the country, then the less democracy, with the exception of India, for instance. India is a good example in some ways of uh, democracy and uh, population at the same time. But of course, in India, we do have also the problems in Kashmir and other places that need to be resolved. It's not to say that uh, it is without problems, but India is a good example of how to balance the need for democracy and cultural understanding and uh, a, a big population at the same time. So we do have an example of India. We did have an example of European Union. European Union was a very good experiment uh, started by you know, Sir Mr. Schumann and then continued on and uh, great thinkers like Jürgen Habermas and Jacques Derrida wrote this wonderful work about European identity and everything. But now, of course, with the resurgence of neo-fascist and neo-Nazi, philosophies and uh, ethnocentrism and uh, fundamentalism in Europe, of course, we see coming back of the era of 1930s. And it's also a very dangerous process because it's uh, when we see the resurgence of neo-fascism, we know, we remember the Holocaust and we remember the barbarities that uh, European civilization has done to the rest of the world, and especially to the Israelis and the uh, Jews and uh, others. Of course, and uh, not just uh, not just Jews, but of course, then we remember, of course, the Turkish genocide of Armenians, the horrible acts committed by so-called civilized nations in the 20th century that were unmatched by any um, other uh, power. So we, in the 21st century, we are in a tough moment. We are facing a horrible reality of pandemics, a time of pandemics that is coming to the world that we need to prepare for to act together to defeat the pandemics. We need to join our hands to defeat the pandemics. And instead of that, we see a rise of nationalism around the world and blaming each other for, uh, for the proliferation of the 
pandemic. So some people are blaming China, some people are blaming uh, Russia, some people are blaming uh, United States, um, etc. And this is, of course, not productive because we are going to be able to defeat pandemics together or we're going to be defeated by it. And this is not the last pandemic that is coming to humanity. We are at the threshold, at the cross point, where we need to be able to defeat this disease. And this disease is truly a very, very uh, serious disease. And the existing physiocratic language, neoliberal language of mainstream media and mainstream uh, uh, discourse, um, to quote Michel Foucault, is not really responding to that challenge. And unfortunately, it's failing. Lots of people mistrust the mainstream institutions. And we need to reorient ourselves and develop and bring a new innovative and creative tools to talk to the people and to reduce the distance between the elites and the people. Because the distance between the elites and the people is huge. And the cultural moment is brought in as a, as a it's, it's a very convenient tool for people who want to have a cultural conflict. But that has, we have seen the bad examples of cultural conflicts. I mean, if we read the book by uh, Hannah Arendt, as a great philosopher of 20th century, she describes how European nations resorted to fascism in the 1920s and 30s uh, and were exterminating each other. And she means not just the Germans, but all of the nations were trying to deal with their national minorities in a very, very ruthless way. And then it has brought uh, the rule of national socialism and it, we have witnessed the horrible, the biggest tragedy of 20th century, which was the Holocaust. Yes, we need to avoid this by avoiding the, uh, the unconditional uh, supremacy of identity politics. Identity politics is a road to our elimination. And we need to find some sort of uh, ways of universalism and equality amongst nations and genders, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to elicit more from the traditional cultures in this, because every culture has a roots of peace building in itself. And we have forgotten about this in light of our fascination with, uh, with the new uh, physiocratic doctrines. And these doctrines, unfortunately, have not worked. I'm done with my first part. <laughs> so. Okay, okay. Um, I would react, I would like to react then uh, that you mentioned that uh, uh, our rapidly changing world. And um, I would like to ask that in your opinion, what is the role of the arts and the culture in, um, in this rapidly changing world and uh, the nonviolent social changes and conflict resolutions? I think the role of the arts and culture is very big. Um, I think it's a very good question. Thank you for that. Because uh, one of the problems that we see in the world uh, since 1980s, when uh, this current crisis has started, is that the culture has seized its role. Uh, culture was reduced to the show business. And unfortunately, of course, this was driven by commercial interests. And I would say there, there were two stages after the World War II. Of course, we have witnessed the horrible reality of the World War II when uh, Mr. Theodor Adorno famously said how one can write a poem after visiting the Holocaust places like Auschwitz. Yes, and uh, after that, uh, we had a resurgence of the humanitarian uh, humanist culture in 1960s. That was the time, the golden period in the history of humanity, when people were able to unite regardless of their race, ethnic origin, ideology, uh, gender, and people were able to overcome those big problems uh, with, uh, with 
their solidarity. And I think the greatest part in economic boom of 1960s and 70s and even 80s was brought by this humanistic spirit of internationalism that was there in 1960s. And it originated, of course, in the West. And uh, of course, there was also a Soviet Union. But at the same time, it came, the impulses came from Mahatma Gandhi's India. Uh, the Gandhian approach of uh, uh, Jai Jagat, yes, the whole long live to the world. Uh, that was the main, main actually, uh, uh, purpose of the, of the, of the uh, big, big movements that was led by, uh, in large part, by artists. You remember Beatles going to India and Bangladesh. And then, of course, lots of gurus speaking at Woodstock and lots of other places. This was a very positive experience, like Jimi Hendrix's experience, unfortunately, which didn't last very long. But it was an incredible, happy moment in the history of humanity. And that's when we were able to overcome the boundaries of the petty bourgeois nationalism and all these identity politics divisions that have divided us for a long time. But after 1980s, uh, the processes started to deteriorate and identity politics came back into the world. Oh, nationalism, ethnocentrism, and uh, of course, neo-Nazism and all the other identity-based uh, philosophies that of course have their own ground. I would not say that this is, we need to completely discount those as this really useless philosophy because people have their own uh, needs to express their own differences. And, uh, and uh, as, as difference, as Mr. Derrida was saying, difference need to be addressed. We need to deal with that. We need to deal with this situation. I mean, when we fought for independence of Georgia, and I was part of this struggle for national liberation of Georgia in 1989 and 1990, we were fighting for independence. We believed that Georgian nation needs to be independent. But then, of course, after coming of this so-called independence, we discovered that we found a lot more uh, inequalities, a lot more injustices, and social deprivation of about 85%, 90% of the people became totally disenfranchised, but also very much marginalized and disempowered economically, first of all. There are small elites in uh, those former Soviet countries, the oligarchs and uh, government uh, authoritarian presidents like Mr. Saakashvili and others who control the whole part of the economy. And large, in, in large, that happens through their involvement in the illegal arms trade or drug trade and stuff like that. This is a transnational operation, but people are starving. So throughout the last 30 years, Georgia has been very miserable because we have achieved independence and I have fought for it. But then uh, the, the structure that came instead of authoritarian, totalitarian Soviet system, is authoritarian neoliberalism that has about 5% of the population ruling over the rest of it. And uh, it's a huge inequality. It's a huge um, a disproportionate distribution of resources and power. And actually, we should not forget uh, a notion of distribution of power, which is also very important. And that has created a very fertile grounds for identity politics. And the groups became divided into the national ethnic groups and they started to blame each other for, you know, it's everything. And that's how, of course, the origins of anti-Semitism are, the, the origins of uh, phobias, different phobias, Armenophobia or Georgophobia or other phobias. And people started to blame each other because you are uh, Jewish or because you are Armenian or Georgian or Azerbaijani, that's why the problem is. But the, the problem is basically identity politics, politics itself. So neoliberal discourse has not brought the, the internationalist discourse. And it's really interesting to read about that. And Mr. Soros also has written about the failures of uh, global capitalism. We are running low on battery. control and plug in the stuff. But in any case, uh, 
Mr. Soros has written about this too, and uh, he has a very good points uh, in 1990s, I think, that uh, instead of the happiness that it promised uh, uh, to former Soviet uh, colonies, it brought misery. It brought misery and this notion of success proved to be very false because there are very few people who have this success, but success basically means stealing the money from the people's uh, pockets. And uh, this new bourgeoisie that has flourished after the neoliberal onslaught uh, is mostly uh, partly criminal and partly nomenclatura who is basically owning everything and right now is not really responsible before the people because it's declared that if you starve, it's your own fault. So 85% um, of the population is starving. And now we can see that during the pandemics even uh, more sharper because majority of people are starving. Even people who are from, from academia, people from who, are, who have the backgrounds that were not entirely very poor, these people are starving too. The world is going to the uh, a verge of total starvation and the world war if we are not going to find the response number one to the global inequality that exists in the world that, that the few people at the wall street and other financial institutions and arms traders and drug traders and oil traders are controlling the world and then of course uh, find the response an alternative to identity politics that at the discourse a neoliberal discourse of identity politics that has ruled the world throughout the last 40 years. Thank you. Um, talking about the economic inequalities, I would, last, I would like to ask you that in your opinion, can we compare the effectiveness of the cultural and the economic factors in conflict resolution? And um, can we say that any of these is, factors is more important than the other? I think uh, I think it would be very, very um, in uh, in a way primitive for me to say that one factor is dominant over the other. The economic factor is always very important, of course, and, and we know that socioeconomic situation is determining a lot of situations. But at the same time, I do not belong to the strictly Marxist point of view that says that socioeconomic factor really defines everything. I think Marx was wrong in uh, uh, really not understanding the ontological needs of human beings. And uh, the, his dialectical materialism was um, in some ways has failed also. It was also a very physiocratic approach. Marxist approach is also a very physiocratic approach which basically does not consider any other meta issues rather than physical and biological needs of human beings, which are very important. Of course, we cannot downgrade the biological needs and need, the needs of the economic, socioeconomic survival, as well as we cannot downgrade other needs that human beings have. But um, in that sense, I mean, ontological needs are very important too. We do have a need for identity, for instance. Of course we do have a need for identity. That doesn't mean we need to become Nazis. And that's the whole point, is the Nazi philosophy is totally based on identity. And it really brings us to the verge of total disaster, catastrophe, World War III, which is gonna annihilate the world. Uh, but we need to consider this is also an ontological need and people are willing to die for their identity. Uh, at the same time, there is a need for uh, human bonding, uh, which I think is even better. Um, yeah, solidarity, need for love. And all those spiritual dimensions, I would call ontological, in the words of John Burton, I would say, that ontological dimensions, spiritual dimensions are there. And uh, we cannot ignore them like Marxists did for a long time. And that's one of the big reasons that they fail because only economy is not able to feed people's, uh, people's um, needs. Uh, we in Soviet Union have revolted. And I remember 1988, 89, 1990, when I was myself 
one of the leading protagonists of the demolition of the Soviet Union, uh, because we did not have our, we had our physical needs satisfied. Soviet Union had a food for everyone. There was a medicine for everyone, a food for everyone. The social situation was much better than now. But the spiritual needs were not taken care of because whatever Marx was saying and even uh, John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and all his predecessors were not really corresponding for our uh, spiritual needs. And spiritual needs were manifested through the films of Charlie Chaplin, for instance, and songs of Louis Armstrong and others, international things, and also folk songs, and also great artists like Charles Danour and others, who were really manifesting this spirit. And this was a spirit of 60s and 70s when humanity prospered. Now, the last 30 years, since the advance of Reaganomics and uh, trickle-down economics and neoliberalism, we are seeing decline, sharp decline in uh, a spirituality, we're seeing a really, really big crisis, and we are seeing the resurgence of identity, of, I would say neo-Nazi politics, of identity-based uh, uh, neoliberal approaches. And because of that, we are seeing the division, big division and resurgence of this. So now, what will be the road for us to overcome these sociocultural divisions. I think we need to find the ways to find the paradigms through arts, through creativity, empathy, and nonviolence. That's what uh, uh, Johan Galton talks about. Johan Galton talks about creativity, empathy, nonviolence. And I love this. This is a brilliant expression. Yes. Through creativity, and it's a Bergsonian notion, yes, that people. Uh, through creative evolution, we achieve the progress in humanity. Not through our, uh, I would say, your biological needs, uh, overcoming the biopolitics. Through creativity, empathy, and nonviolence, and moving forward, and, and declaring Jai Jagat to the world. Yes, declaring the Gandhi's long live to the world. There is no nationality defining the world. There is no ethnicity defining the world. We are defining the world because each of us is the citizen of the world. And 21st century is for seven and a half billion citizens of the world. One person, man or a woman, regardless of a gender, and regardless of nationality, regardless of religion, one person, one vote, and one roof over the head. This was a really nice uh, thought, and I was about to ask, like, what is your opinion how we should, um, like, stop this crisis and blaming? And these were, like, just incredible thoughts, and I totally agree with you that uh, we should uh, find our way back to empathy and um, all of those things that you mentioned. And, um, like, I would like to ask one more thing as, like, a closing question, if it's okay for you. And um, uh, my question is uh, regarding for the field of peace studies and conflict resolution. And I would like to ask, how do you connect the performing arts and the problem solving conflict uh, resolution? I think that's a very good uh, issue to discuss. Uh, I think the emerging field of conflict resolution and peace studies is very important and I have, um, I've been very lucky to be able to be involved with uh, George Mason Institute, um, George Mason University Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. I was there in 1990s and uh, I was able, actually, I was very lucky to be a student of uh, people like Rajamohan Gandhi and Dennis Sandoli and Christopher Mitchell and Kevin Clements and Michelle LeBaron and Juliana Burkhoff and uh, Johan Galtung, etc. Amazing teachers were there. Uh, Richard Rubinstein was one of those uh, amazing personalities that uh, totally changed our life. Many of his students, and he's still around, and uh, uh, God bless him. Uh, 
the, this is the transformational field, the transformational institution, and it has brought a, a, a lot of change already. And I believe that there is a chance that we will be able to transform our realities through creative approaches. We need to find creative ways to get closer to each other, to become more international, to become more uh, non-identity based nation of the world. And this is the time for it. I mean, we have a 21st century already, 20 years. We have entered the 21st century and we have seen the problems that identity politics gives to us. We have seen the problems and catastrophes and miseries that identity politics has really brought upon us. Right now, we need to find a new universalist approach. Uh, Alan Badiou talks about St. Paul, a big universalist of the uh, first century ID, yes, and how he was able to bring together lots of people uh, under the banner of uh, love and compassion. Yes, uh, and uh, of course, it's not easy. But this is not easy. But at the same time, we have a great example of Mahatma Gandhi. We have a great example of Nelson Mandela. We have a great example of Vaslav Hava. We have a great example of Mera Kostava and Via Kamsapuri and others, the humanists of the end of 20th century that were Gandhians in their spirit. And unfortunately, what I miss in the discourse of the beginning of 21st century is mentioning of Mahatma Gandhi more and mentioning of uh, those people, uh, men and women alike, who were transforming the world nonviolently. And transforming the world nonviolently needs a, a, a force. Of course it needs a force. It needs a charisma and force of those people and truth. Um, and I do not consider a charisma a phenomenon that is based on a personal talent of someone. Of course, there are lots of people who are mis, um, who are basically spreading the false ideologies and false news, the fake news. Yes, These people have the false charisma. But really, what we need to have is that charisma based on truth. Truth is very important aspect to it. And based upon truth that all humans are created equal, all humans are citizens of the world of 21st century. And if we have to survive, we have to survive together. And all of human beings, all seven and a half billion people have the creative genius to do something, to contribute to our survival, because we are at the moment of big crisis that we need to overcome. Will it be a biological, biopolitical, geopolitical, or others? And uh, here I will recall, I would like to recall the words of Beni Achikwishvili, the head of the Burian Anarchist Republic, who said that if people do not unite, they cannot survive the tragedy. We need to find the ways, creative ways, to unite. And creative ways are not easy to find, but they're possible because in each and every human being, there is a creative genius that can do it. I think this is the best way to finish our discussion with these, uh, these talks. And I would like to thank you for sharing your thoughts and ideas. And I would like to thank you for this really interesting lecture. I feel I learned a lot from you. So I would personally also thank you uh, for this lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>